today, I'd love to do a reminder of what marketing is, and then in particular, business to business marketing. So business to business marketing is used to describe the marketing activities of any kind of organization, which has exchanged relationships with other organizations or businesses. And we're very much going to look at those exchange relationships on a spectrum. Okay, as consumers, we often engage with a lot of market exchanges where we go out, we decide, we, we identify our needs, we go out and find a solution to that problem, and we buy that solution very transactionally. In business to business, as the level of complexity rises, as with the amount of involvement in the process, so too do we move to value added exchanges whereby we're looking more about what we value. So we become less price sensitive and looking more at how we can solve the problem as well as getting value for the duration of the life cycle of that product. Moving towards the collaborative exchanges at the end of that scale. And at the end of that scale, we increase the strength of the collaboration, but also the more involved we are with the seller and the more collaborative we become in fulfilling our need, so too then it becomes more difficult to substitute relationships. And that's not too different to you as consumers. The higher the involvement in the product, the more you might interact with a organization, the more you want to get to know them, trust them, and get to really start working together to solve your problems. And the same as such in all businesses, albeit that in business exchanges, often the values are far higher and those sales are far more complex. Today, we're going to look at the expanded buying determinant theory, and this will look at the environmental factors that affect the sale of a product or service. And remember that marketing isn't just about products anymore. We are in an advanced industrialized economy, and this is where we have moved beyond just products to also having services, product service blends. And again, this affects you as consumers, but also businesses. So we'll look at the environmental factors, identify what they are, how they might affect the decision making process. We'll look at the market factors that affect both the organizations and individuals, organizational factors, and then coming right down to the individual. Because remember, even though it's one organization buying from another, the reality is that it's both it's buyers and sellers and people at the heart of every purchase that takes place. I love marketing mainly because it is that beautiful blend of economics and psychology. You know, on one hand, you've got the macroeconomic forces that infect the external environment that make decisions. So there's political changes that take place, you know, the machinations of politics, trade wars. You've got things like sugar taxes, the economic situations within countries that affect the buying behavior. You look at the sociocultural effects. So what kind of populations are there? Are they growing? Are they shrinking? What's going on? Are there ch shifts in values and behaviors? What kind of technology is coming on board that will enable customers to solve their problem in a different way? How might new technologies disrupt what we already do? And how can we as organizations not just comply with environmental laws and regulations, but actually show environmental leadership? And again, there's those legal factors. What is it that we have to stick to to ensure that we don't get fined or break the law? Because there is a rule of law in every country. So these are the environmental forces that organizations have to account for. So these are factors that affect everyone in the industry, not just the organization. And these are factors that you can mitigate against, but you are not in direct control of. So as marketers, we carry out a great deal of research into what these factors are. Horizon scanning to predict the future and how our industry might be disrupted. We then move away from that macroeconomics to those organizational forces that are in play within every organization. This could be things like extrinsic reward systems, things like how you're bonused, how do you get your promotions, how do you as an individual make those decisions as to what to buy? Do you have the power to buy? Larger the organization, the more there is a tendency to go to centralized buying. This is where there is a central function that then uses the economies of scale to get better prices, better solutions to their members. Or there could be just decentralized functions, okay? Decentralized buying. And this is where managers are allowed to buy whatever they feel is suits their local needs. 
And again, you as marketers will need to identify the forces that are in play in organizations because then you can adapt your strategies. If you are looking to sell to an organization with a centralized buying process, your focus will be very much on how to affect that centralized function, how to tailor your solutions and your communications to that central buying team. Identify what their purchasing policies are, what their credit facilities are, what their payment terms are, and all of this will become as a part of those negotiations. And also the identification of whether you actually want to do business with this organization or not. Likewise, in decentralized buying situations, your strategy will be very much focused on how to identify those managers with those needs that you have the solution for. How will you affect them? What are their individual skills? Okay, what's their degrees of specialization? How much do they actually know about your product, your service, and even the problem that they are experiencing so that you're not just fulfilling their communicated needs, but their uncommunicated needs as well, so that you can get a holistic solution that differentiates you from your competitors. Once you've identified those individual forces, remember that we are people buying from people. I work a lot in the railway industry and engineering, but in the railway industry, there's often the term that there are two main challenges that people face within their roles, self-preservation and self-promotion. So if you're selling to someone who is in that self-preservation mode, it's all about communicating the risk, making sure that they are happy with the level of risk in the purchase. Those who are carrying out self-promotion activities, you very much get to understand what they need to show to get their promotion case. So how can you create a solution that enables them to show innovation going beyond their role to turn your customer into the hero? And again, you move away from those transactional market exchanges to that collaboration, to that very, very detailed and embedded service within that organization, which makes it harder to switch. One of the main factors that also plays into those individual purchases is the individual's experience of that purchase, whether that is a new task purchase. So are they buying something for the very first time to solve a problem that is newly identified to them? Or is this a straight rebuy? Have they been buying this for years and years and years? And it's just a case of pressing a button, making no changes to the supplier, to the individual, to anything like that. And you'll recognize this from you as individuals as well when you start to make your decisions as to what to buy. If it's something that you've never bought before, so let's say you're looking to buy a car or get married, these are very, very high involvement purchases. You've never done it before, so you search for a lot of information about it. You identify that you have that need. You go out and find information. And the more information you find, the more you get to know about your need. Your needs may change at the more information you get. So once you have that new needle problem, you start on that extensive information search. You identify what your requirements are. You have a look at what the alternatives are to solving this issue. And again, you look at your financial risk. The higher the involvement, the higher the cost, often that's when more people start to get involved. And that's no different in business. Once you go on to that modified buying task, so let's say you've bought a car, you've had your first car, you now know how it works for you and doesn't work for you. Your next car, you build on that knowledge. Okay, You know what it is you want. You also know what it is you don't want. You have a better understanding. You may decide that you don't want a Kia and now you want to go for a Mitsubishi. Okay, So you're then doing an ev evaluation of suppliers. How might this new product fulfill your needs better than the last? Then we get down to the straight rebuy. So that is where you're happy with what you've bought, you're happy with the supplier, you make no changes, press the button and order it again. Increased repetition of that purchase means that there's less time and complexity that it goes into considering those alternatives. And again, that information search is almost non-existent with a straight rebuy. Find that order, press the button again. Whereas with that new task purchase, it is very often very complex, very time consuming, but also that information searches often correlates with that perceived financial risk. While you and I, when we're making decisions as consumers, we often just identify a need, go out and fill it. The buying business buying process is a lot more formalized. The organization will recognize that they have a problem that needs solving. They'll then generate that need description and create a product specification. 
This product specification allows suppliers to identify whether their products fit the company's needs. The organization will then carry out a supplier search. They might find prospective suppliers for this product and invite them to bid for the work. If Network Rail would like to buy new sleepers, new infrastructure, new tunnel, whatever the need, they will create that specification. They'll go out and invite those who they think will be able to fulfill this need to submit a bid. They're very, very time consuming often. They can take up a huge amount of resources. So companies often, those suppliers, make a decision whether they will bid or not against the work. Once that bid process has been carried out, Network Rail or the company will select the supplier that they're going to go with. They'll create the order routine specification. So if it's something like a bridge, you'll probably only order it once or twice in a generation. Whereas if it's something like railway sleepers, once they fail, they might need them over and over and over again. So they'll work out how often they'll need to buy them, how often they may need to replace them and put in place that process for being able to create a straight rebuy situation. Because it's in everyone's interest to create a straight rebuy because it takes up less time, resources and consideration of alternatives. Organizations then carry out performance reviews on that product and that supplier. How are they performing against the proposal that they submitted. If they're not performing, then those problems are recognized and the whole process starts again. And at each stage in this process, you'll have different types of behaviors taking place. And those behaviors are very much linked to the hierarchy of effects. Whilst we'd love to think it is a linear process, consumers often jump back and forth within that process. It's the same in business, okay? You can often go through the extensive bid process and then you realize that actually the bids that have been submitted don't fulfill your problem or your need. So you may need to revisit what your problem is to make it clearer, to make it more detailed. I won't go into the minutiae of what these strategies are. In the lecture, what we would do is we go into the detail about what these strategies are. Cognitive strategy is all about creating that awareness of that problem. So we tailor our content to helping customers understand more about their problem, more about our solution. And so we might put out content such as podcasts, blogs, social media posts to make those customers aware of you as an organization and of your solution for their problems. In the middle of the funnel, this is when we get to the evaluation stage. This is where we try to draw those customers in to actually start interacting with us as an organization, start getting them to move away from that passive content absorption that takes place in that awareness stage to actually interacting with us? How do we get them to engage so that they become leads that we can then convert into sales? How can we educate the customer about the solution that we have? And then there is that conversion. And this is when at the bottom of the funnel, what kind of activity do, can we carry out to make you convert and as customers in the railway industry, I often send our sales teams out to then convert those leads into actual sales. So the sales team might go out and carry out demonstrations of the product. They might go out and identify customer stories to make my product more bespoke. So hopefully that's got you thinking a bit about how you make decisions, how you as marketers will start to know how to identify that buyer journey where your buyer might be at. And also in the subsequent lectures, we talk about how we tailor those communications and processes that we have in place to capture the maximum amount of those customers and inform them so that they're making informed business purchase decisions.